coming to you live from downtown Detroit. This is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, traders and investors. Welcome to this Thursday, almost New Year's edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Thinkorswim. I'm Spencer Israel, here with Joel Conan and Dennis Dick. On today's show, not a lot going on in the markets as expected. We are going to talk about this uh, NVIDIA move and uh, what happened yesterday before Andrew left, after Andrew left, during Andrew left, while he was on tweeting and then going on CNBC talking about why he is short. We're also going to talk about this uh, Kate Spade takeout rumor, and I think we all saw, or maybe not all of us, but some of us saw this uh, questionable at best options trade about 10 10 minutes or so before that rumor hit the wire, so we're going to talk about that as well. We also have some uh, flying warehouse news out of Amazon and a couple other random stories to discuss. Plus, we'll talk about anything you want today if it's ticker related. Uh, we have one guest on the show today. It's at 835. Phil Davis, founder of Phil's Stock World, going to tell us about what is on his radar heading into the new year. Joel. How are we looking in the S&Ps on this lovely Thursday morning? Why does it have to be ticker related? I mean, you know, I mean, it's a slow day in the market. You said anything in the chat as long as it's ticker related. You're right. That's true. All right. Uh, S&Ps quiet session, five point range. Uh, We did take out the low from yesterday, but only by a few ticks. So 42 and a quarter is my number on the downside for continued uh, decline. On the upside, no higher than 47.50. Thought we might get into the 22.50 handle overnight, uh, keeping an eye trading right near the pre-market high. Not much resistance in the 50 handle if they can get this thing going to the upside. Crude down nine cents, just hanging out at 54 here for a few days. Uh, little gold rally, gold up 6.20. Silver getting a pop here, up almost a dime, back over the psychological 16 dollar level. Dennis, how you doing on this Thursday morning? Doing pretty good. Looking for looking for action here, Joel. Just combing the ditches because there's not a lot of action here this morning. But there was action yesterday, though, and it, the fireworks came, and it came in at the form of a tweet from Andrew Left. Yeah, Spencer, do you have that tweet pulled up? Or basically, you know, what he did, and this is just perfect timing, Dennis. I mean, it's funny. We just kept on talking about it on the show yesterday. I knew the bubble's going to burst. I just thought maybe January 1st because everybody's going to start taking their profits. But Andrew Left intervened to make the bubble burst early. And you don't know, but I have tried to tell you about the 10-day up in a row rule. And, you know, sometimes it's the 8-day, 9-day, 10-day, 11-day. Stocks cannot go (laughs) up. More than 10 days in a row. That's, That's what ex- you said yesterday on the show. <laughs> you had perfect timing on that one, too. They can't go up 11 days in a row, so you might as well short this the video thing today. Uh, yeah, or... Yeah, well, he, unbelievable. He, he tweeted yesterday at... What time is this at? This is at 9.39. He tweeted that, you know... Uh, we've long been fans of NVIDIA, but the market is disregarding headwinds. In 2017, we've seen NVIDIA head back to 90. And then what happened? Right. Boom. Stock falls 10 points. Uh, great point by Ace here. Uh, look at on the on the open yesterday, that 4 a.m. open of the pre-market session, just the buying euphoria. Hits 120.36, right? 120, yeah. a whole number. I mean, you could have said about yeah. 105, 110, 115, 120. Uh, but it hits that in the pre-market, and then I got a five-minute chart here. And then right off the open, and I noticed that it started to go in – down a little bit before that. Couldn't it get to 120. Uh, what was the high from yesterday? 119.96. So I know a lot of whole numbers have uh, gone by the wayside in here. But uh, that high comes up at 119.93. And then left got it going. A free for all. I did notice one other opportunity that you got when it dropped from uh, 120 just under uh, to 110. It was or it actually went to 109 at that time, so that was 11 point move, five and a half. I was thinking, man, if this gets back up to 114 here, yeah, you know, maybe I could, shot. yeah, lay some more yeah. out. 
but you I- know I'm kicking myself on that one too. That same point because uh, Jamie from Bright, we were just talking there, and he listens to the show. Hi, Jamie, if you're listening. But uh, the stock went down from 120 to 110, and then it started popping up 113, 114. He was asking what I thought. You know, is this you know is it coming back on the comeback trail? And I was just looking. I was like, you know what? I'm like this thing looks broken to me now, and I think bounces are to be sold. And I was saying that to him right when it was at 114. Yet I didn't sell, and that would have been the perfect spot. And obviously the stock continued down, and then and then and the pre market says low as 105 here. So we basically fell another nine points from there. So now if you're coming in short, now now you feel a little late to the party because we just dropped over 10 percent here so they didn't really give you much of a chance but that's what happens when you get a tweet that's moving it is andrew left you know just going on the side tangent about citron do you think andrew left is the most influential person out there now besides donald trump in the markets yeah I on mean, an individual stock yeah and that's it you were mentioning too that that ain't no little stock here it's not uh no. you know some uh adr or foreign stock or i guess we have yeah small cap or mid cap that you know often you know andrew left comes out you know and the volume isn't there so a little bit of selling pressure can really drive it down i mean he drove down nvidia 10 percent yesterday that's incredible and what do you do now if you're a fund manager okay and you're like oh boy i gotta get this in my portfolio this week and uh well no i'm not gonna buy it 100 no i'm not gonna buy it at 110 but you buy it between 110 and 120 now now you look like a, you know, now you have it in your portfolio. Yeah, I'm long it, but I'm long at the top. So now the resistance comes in. There's going to be a lot of people. I miss the uh-huh. top. It's going to 90 bucks. Boom. I, I'm glad that it's not, it's not gapping down too much here because I'd rather see it not gap down and just go down in an orderly way. But uh, we'll see. I mean, I was, uh, yeah, I was looking at this thing at 120 and I'm like, okay, I got to triple down for the third time here. And uh, it was just too quick. It was just, I couldn't get it. I noticed that I didn't, I wasn't following Andrew Left on Twitter. I certainly added him to my Twitter. You're not for, following I, Andrew Left on Twitter? I don't know how. I, I don't know how I didn't do that. I that don't know. should be right at the top of your tweet deck, Joel. Yeah, I know. Citron. I know. But uh, we'll see what happens now. Citron and Donald Trump. Those are the two that shouldn't leave your screen. <laughs> used, to, used to be icon. You know what? Icon used to be the mover. You're right. Icon used to be very influential. When he would say I was long a stock, it would pop 5 6 7%. And now you have Citron. Like Andrew left. I mean, he says, I think NVIDIA is going back to 90. Everybody throws in the towel immediately, and they're trying to drive it there. You know, and it gets halfway there in two days, not even 24 hours later. It gets halfway back to 90. This guy is influential. I saw a tweet yesterday. Not sure who it was. Um, I don't know if I actually retweeted it or not. Let me just go check my timeline. And I could actually read you the tweet. Uh, no, I didn't. But I uh, so, you know, just what I was going to say is uh, the, the tweet basically said that you know, just imagine you know Andrew left Citron, and we're just speculating. But he shorts the stock. He says, okay, it's getting overdone. I start short 105, 110. It goes up to 120. He goes, I'm, I'm getting pissed off about this. You know, I'm down 10% already in my short. So I'm just going to throw a tweet to bring the stock back in. So I throw it out there and say, yeah, I think the stock's going to 90. And boom, it's right back and he's not down it anymore. Like, that's pretty, in, I don't know, it's pretty pretty good. Uh, the tweet said it was a pretty good gig, and I completely agree. I did the same thing. It's a great gig he's got going on there. I mean, you get down a stock, it's like, I can move to bring this back in. I'll just say, you know, I think it's going to 90. And boom. It's what, right back in. He's not down in the position probably anymore. What do you think about Dr. J? Dr. J's fired up. He thinks this is totally illegal activity, shorting it for the last three days, and then he comes out. I mean, yeah, I can see that side of it, but people don't have to sell, right? They don't. I mean, well, what is he doing illegally? He's just giving his opinion. I mean, really, what is he doing? His opinion is just worth that much to the market right now. Everybody jumps at everything he says. So, I mean, really, he's not doing anything illegal. He's just talking his buck. And now everybody talks their buck. It's just the fact that his opinion is worth way more than everybody else's. Yep, good point. All right, let's cover more than one stock today. Well, when the NVIDIA started rolling over, you saw other stocks that, you know, and I'll call these the high flyers of 2016, the ones that we thought maybe January 1st were going to start rolling over. Well, that party ended early, so you can look at AMD. Same story. As soon as NVIDIA started rolling over, as soon as that tweet came out, AMD started collapsing as well. And it actually, they actually started going down a little bit before that. They really opened at the highs, and there was some profit taking coming in. But once that tweet came out a few minutes after the open, they hit AMD, they hit Micron. They hit applied materials. They hit all these stocks that had pretty good 2016s. And everybody started hitting the 
panic button later in the day. They started hitting the panic button on everything. Even the financials started rolling over later in the day. So you saw Goldman coming back in, Morgan dropping almost 80 cents there, you know, from the highs of the day. Bank of America starting to roll over to the tune of about 2%. So you really saw it start to roll over into a lot of the sectors that have been very strong. So early profit taking. Probably people saying, look, I just watched my, a lot of my NVIDIA gains fade. I'm not going to watch my you know, financials you know, gains fade. I'm not going to watch my gains in AMD fade here. I'm going to book some profits here early. I don't care that you know, I'm going to have to pay the tax in 2016 because I don't want my profits to go away. And that's what you saw, a little bit of panic profit taking, I will call it, in all of the leaders. And that was really what your catalyst was. It started with, with uh, obviously NVIDIA, and then it rolled over as, I'll call it, panic profit taking ensued. And Dennis, we used to do this a lot more at, uh, you know, when we traded at Bright and groups together, you know, we would keep the, the leader up there and, you know, maybe not hop on a NVIDIA, but, you know, a lot of times, you know, and I'd, you know, at this point I'd have, you know, NVIDIA, Micron, AMD group together and yep. you don't, you don't want to, you know, you know, you're going to have extreme volatility in NVIDIA, but you know, boom, you think, oh, NVIDIA, uh, AMD, lower price stock. Boom, you could throw out a short in that and see if you got the follow through. So that's, you know, kind of the, the sympathy trading and kind of the, you know, gang trading that, you know, we used to do when, uh, you know, yep. when you had all those stocks up there. So you don't necessarily have to hop on the leader, the one with the hot, hot news. You just got to know your correlations. Yeah, and they change over time. Like people will say, you know, certain companies, like what the hell does the financials have to do with NVIDIA? Well, right now, it just has to do that everybody had profits in that. It gets the psychology of the market, maybe the money managers, maybe people saying, hey, it only takes a few money managers to start moving stock. I mean, if you're with Fidelity and you say, or, you know, maybe I should use a hedge fund because they trade a little more actively, but you want to book some gains early, you panic a little bit, you've got a few million dollars worth of stock to sell, you'll push the stock down a little bit. So, <clears throat> That's what really happened. It just started to ensue. People started to panic on that are sitting on some big profits because you can even see a sector like U.S. Steel. Look at that one, for instance. X opened up yesterday, was trading higher, and NVIDIA starts rolling over, and it starts rolling over there too. Same story. U.S. Steel's had an incredible run here in the last few months. When you go out to the weeklies, obviously, it started 2016, way down at $6, $35. People sit on huge gains for this, probably looking to book them. They were probably looking to book them early January so they don't have to pay the gains until 20, at the end of 2017 but obviously and, and there might be lower taxes but you know then they start panicking a little bit well we better take some of these gains now because i just watched you know nvidia fall 10 percent. i don't want my u.s steel to fall 10 percent. trying to you know to save a little bit on the tax and we were saying that on the show if you're making investment decisions based on not paying the tax until next year sometimes you can get burned and those who were doing that in nvidia probably got burned yesterday and obviously on some of these other stocks you know i think the portfolio managers that are managing money didn't want to get burned there too so they started taking profits there as well well, early. Uh, just, you know, spilling over to this, I know that uh, I don't see Violin Maker in here in the chat, but he was like, you know, last couple of days, he's like, you know, how do you pick a top in this? How do you, you know, you find a top? Well, I, obviously, when I started buying puts when it was 100, I was trying to pick a top in it. And I was looking for either want to see some kind of technical, paddle, uh, technical pattern or or a catalyst, and in this point, the it was the catalyst. It was it was uh, Andrew left. The tweet. Yeah, the tweet by him. But I, what I want to talk about here is Goldman Sachs because this is the cotton pattern that I like to look at. Uh, nice move up, almost near the high of the moves here. Tight ranges, right, right up near a whole number at 240. Now, is this another consolidation to go to 260? Or is this thing finally going to take a breather here? Now, I'm going to look at this, these series of lows here. And uh, my New Year's resolution is not to do any more weekly options. So I'll look at that. <laughs> Got to stop buying like, weekly. <laughs> Write that down on your little sheet of paper. Stop buying <laughs> weekly options. Exactly. Because uh, if I would have been doing that in the video, I would have been dead. But because I started small and I was looking at the January and Februarys, then, you know, I said, OK, you know, one day it has to go down. Right. And that was the day. So we'll <laughs> see what happens. But this is the kind of pattern I like to look at here in Goldman Sachs. Huge run up. You had a similar kind of thing here. You had to run up the consolidation, another move up. Now, is this consolidation going to move another 20 point move to 260? Well, you know, if I own some puts, then, you know, I can live at my loss. But this is the kind of technical pattern that I like to see when you don't have a catalyst like a tweet from Andrew Left. 
I think you just got to be cautious here now. There is people sitting on huge gains here in all of the financials. They watched NVIDIA's gains fade quickly yesterday. I would have NVIDIA on my screen. Even if you don't trade NVIDIA, it is the market leader here right now. There is absolutely no doubt. It's down another buck and a half in the pre-market. But a lot of times you see these trends reverse. I always say the 10 a.m. rule. When you get a big down day, there's usually follow through the next day at the open. As you have the Johnny come lately, he's calling their broker overnight. You know, the people who have day jobs, they come home at 5 o'clock. They see their NVIDIA. They say, what the hell happened to NVIDIA here today? They call the broker up the next morning and say, look, I want to book some of these gains. I'm sitting up. I bought NVIDIA at $90 you know, a couple weeks ago. I just watched half my gains go away. Get me out. So that's the follow through. That's the two-day rule that I talk about. It's my own thing, the two-day rule. But you know, that's the follow through. And it's working here this morning because NVIDIA is down another dollar and a half. A lot of times you'll see a flush. Right at 9.30, 9.35, 9.40, as all those orders come into the market, the Johnny come lately, say, get me out. You see the flush, maybe the video goes down, test 105, 104, 103. You know, if it really got crazy, maybe it tests 100. And then you see the turn, and the buyers start to come and emerge, usually at 10 a.m. And then sometimes by the end of the day, can actually close higher. So if I'm trying to predict, and Linda was asking my crystal ball, I just gave you, trying to give you a prediction of what I think the path might look like for the intraday chart of NVIDIA mm -hmm. today. I'm trying to call the whole damn path. So I'm <laughs> saying week off the open for the first half an hour, maybe gets down to 104, 105, and then the buyers start to emerge. And then, you know, and I'm saying it in a real worst case scenario. So if I'm looking to get long NVIDIA, I'm looking at it around 10 o'clock, maybe 9.50, 9.55, starts to get down another five, six points. I think buyers will emerge in this. And I think the stock could actually close back up near, near flat. So if it goes down to 103, 104, I think it could come back all the way to 110. Now, Ace always wants to make predictions. I'm, I don't think I've ever made a prediction that much to call the path of the stock. But that's what I'm trying to do for you this morning. Obviously, just my opinion. But that's what, you know, I just from I see those patterns happen after you get a big flush day like we did yesterday in the video. Uh, with all that talk there, I don't know if we could get a wager out of this. Yeah, but... you're scared of me? <laughs> okay. I... Come on. What's a wager? <laughs> I mean, I know for sure it's not closing above 110. I know that. Well, the problem is it's I down... think it's going to go down I know. first. Okay. So, well, you give me like 10. Well, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I, I would say it's going to trade 105. 105. Yeah, first. that's too tough of a call. I think uh, I think what uh, though what Linda was asking for was more of a little bit of a longer term thing. And here you got to, I mean, you got to wait for some kind of bounce and then a 50 percent retracement. So let's say it goes to 120 down to 105, 15 point move. You know, see if it bounces up to 112 and a half. It looks like so, you know something like that. Yeah. Um, also, I think you're gonna get a flush though first. I think you're gonna see another little bit of a flush. And uh, also, this time, this is one of the rare occasions where I'll kind of rely on a 15-minute chart here. And now, to me, 114. Like, if I had caught any kind of long in this thing and it got up near 114 because that was the rebound off the initial low, that would be a, uh, a great area uh, to take a look at. But uh, also look at the daily lows here in NVIDIA. And this is – we're done with NVIDIA after this. But, well, uh, I mean, one more thing, because buy <laughs> Apple is making a point here, and buy Apple from the chat, so I'm not saying buy Apple. That's his username. He says, I'll just read it. He says, Dennis, you don't think people who own stocks do online trading now instead of calling <laughs> the brokers these days? Same thing, though. It still applies. So, even okay, so I gave the analogy of calling your broker, but you're the same thing. You're a Johnny come lately. You have a day job. You come home. You're sitting there sending your orders overnight and saying, look. Get me out. So you go on your online broker. You know, it's equivalent to calling your broker is what I'm saying. You know, I'm just using, you know, the old days calling your broker. But same thing, you know, you're going online. You're going into your brokerage system and sending an order to sell. So it still applies. It's still putting pressure on the stock the next day. So the two-day rule probably applies even more so because it's so easy for people to just go into their brokerage account and send the sell order the next day. So all I'm pointing out is that the people who didn't see in the intraday action, who are working until 5 o'clock, come home the next day and send their orders to sell in the video the next morning. And that's why you get the follow-through the next morning. So the easy trade usually is when you see a stock that's been on a run, it has a huge down day, the easy trade is actually to take it home short and then cover it the next morning as, you know, usually there's follow-through the next morning because of those Johnny come late leaves. All right, Ace is making a couple good points here. Uh, the first one is, and I don't know if you were tuning in to uh, CNBC, but uh, John Kerry's statements uh, with Israel, and you're talking about another catalyst. I mean, you don't want, you know, soft relations between the U.S. and Israel. That's what's going on. So you're talking about a little international uncertainty. I think that coincided midday with the markets already going 
going in motion. That was another catalyst. And then um, in NVIDIA, I mean, I see a double bottom, a couple double bottoms to take a look at. Uh, one, uh, it already took out at the 106.40 area, and there's another double bottom between 103.71 and 104.12. So call 104 even, uh, perhaps the next stopping point, and that coincides with the pre-market low. I don't know anything about Israel relations. I don't know anything about <laughs> politics, really, for the most part. We're just following what we see on the technicals here. And the market overall started rolling yesterday, too. So let's just talk overall market. You know, NVIDIA was the catalyst here. But when you start looking at the S&P futures, that was a pretty good flush. Anybody who is sitting on gains for the year looking to book them in 2017, it applies to the overall S&P futures here as well and i think you know if you start to see a rally here in the s&p futures i think you're going to see another pullback here this morning so we're getting a little bit of a pop here we're up you know one or two s&p points i think you're going to see follow through here in the first 30 minutes so same thing from nvidia two-day rules applied to the s&p futures here as well and then you know i think after 10 o'clock maybe you see a little bit of you know people coming in here to buy the dip again because buy the dip always wins in the long run right joel RD, the imbalances don't come out until 8.30, and NVIDIA being a NASDAQ stock here. It's uh, 9.28 on NASDAQ. So, you know, that's the one thing, and I get this question, you know, because I tweet and talk about the imbalances. They're like, why do you never talk about NASDAQ imbalances? Well, they don't come out till 9.28. They only give you two minutes to respond to those. So, obviously, in the 9.28, I'm not tweeting anything out. I'm responding to those imbalances that come out. But the New York ones do come out at 8.30. So, you know, you can get a good early look at it. But on a video, we won't know much until 928 when that first imbalance comes out. I think there's got to be a sell imbalance. I mean. Oh, yeah. It's down two bucks. <laughs> I think it's a pretty good guess it's going to be a sell imbalance and it's going to be big. All right. Now we are officially done with the video for the rest of the show. Okay, down with NVIDIA. We Thank won't even do God. the five-minute NVIDIA price update like we promised we're going to continue to do forever. Spencer, what else do you got for us? You were talking Amazon. Flying warehouse? What do we mean, Amazon flying warehouse? I want details of this. Amazon won a patent for a flying warehouse that could deploy drones who deliver stuff to you. Uh, so this is I'm, I'm looking at a CNBC article right now. It's it, it looks the drawing on it is it looks like a blimp, but the way it would work is um it would uh it would just be a warehouse full of stuff that you can, you know, order, you know, you're at a football game or whatever, you, uh, you, you want, you want, you want a snack, you see the Amazon. What? You no, stop. no, no, stop. 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 Hey, let, this let me, let me finish. going to come and fly over the football game and drop let, you a snack let me with, finish. 20, with the other 50,000 people? Yes, yes. <laughs> what kind of snack? It, it, it could advertise, uh, you know, cookies. You're like, I want cookies. Order cookies on Amazon. They, they, the drone comes down and delivers it to you. The drone goes back up. They, uh, they, they don't crash because, you know, their the algorithm says what path all the other drones are taking. So, um, but that's like the, that's just one like use case. There's there's a bajillion use case examples. So this warehouse is basically a, it's a flying blimp that Amazon has patented. You sure. Is this correct? Sure. Yeah. Uh, it it would fly at around forty five thousand feet. Stocked with a ton, a ton of products, uh, it wouldn't even have to land to refuel. They could refuel it, you know, but they could bring fuel up to the warehouse. Do they have people working in it, or is this all I don't automated? <laughs> I don't know. Are they gonna have security guards? Because what about if they flew over, you know, in, like you know that movie, and the pirates got the blimp? The pirates got the blimp. What movie? You know, the, the, there's the pirate issue. Remember that movie, Captain? Uh, Captain what's Phil Hanks? Captain what's the movie? Phillips. Captain Phillips. Captain Phillips. Yeah. So those pirates will get their own blimps, and they'll go up yeah. there and rob those that Amazon blimp. Did Amazon think about that? Did they think about the pirates? <laughs> 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 Gosh, this show. I don't think we, this, about we went on a real tangent. Should we now? take tomorrow off? Oh my god! Should we just and should we just be the last show of the year here? Oh Jesus! Okay, no pirate blimps. But anyways, I don't flying flying warehouse. Man, Amazon thinks of everything. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, they they think of everything. So, uh, they won't allow them at football games because it could interfere with the players. Something again, it, they... it's only it's only it's only a patent. That's 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 not getting ahead it's of exciting, ourselves. Though. Though. The <laughs> possibilities of flying let's not pull, Amazon warehouse. Let's, let's not pull in a video and get ahead of ourselves. Let's just, What's let's Amazon just... doing here this morning? When was this announced? Last night? <laughs> well, actually, no. That's the funny thing is the patent was uh, awarded back in April, but it only oh, this is old news. But it, but it, but but it only circulated this week. The news of it. Oh, so. 
Uh, what do you think, Amazon? Let's stop and talk technicals here because this is an interesting chart. Even very. looking just from the last three months. 840, we're going to let Joel do the air math on this. Down to 710. What do we got there? 130 yes. points. And we got 65 from 140 710. Savage. You're, oh, this is beautiful. You're, this is you're a, kicking around that 50% retracement here. Almost to a T. Almost to a T. And uh, I did mention this yesterday on the show because this was trading up because uh, Evercore said that you had to go out and like sell all your stocks and put this in your portfolio because it's the best stock to pick of 2017. And it popped up to 780. And you talk about whole numbers here. High of the number. day, 78000. Right there, 780. I was looking for a little more than that because you had two highs at 780.86 and 780.246. So I thought maybe it, you know, it might take out, but it's probably there was just a big seller there at the whole number, right? You know, just like yeah. I bet yeah. you 10,000 shares. I bet you if you put 10,000 shares of Amazon out, it'll it, pause. It will pause. Or 5,000 or an iceberg. That's a big order. It's 10,000 shares on a $780 stock. It's big money. Yeah, but I'm looking for this. I mean, I could do the uh, I can't do the exact math yet, but uh, you did. Dennis is talking about the retracement here, uh, eight forty seven to seven ten. What's that? One hundred and thirty seven. So that's like sixty seven. So you add, oh yeah, seventy seventy. So let's call it seven seventy seven seven eighty. If I don't seven eighty. If I don't see five closes or a few closes over seven. Five closes. Why five? I don't know. Three. Was there a five-day rule on the floor? Did no. You the no, five I just, I just, cause, just, cause, just threw that number out there. Yeah, because usually if I, you why know, do you want? Stop. I'm going to ask you a question. Why do you want the close over the level though? Because you know this is something you taught me back in the day. But why? So you get a technical level, and you'll say breach it intraday. It doesn't matter. Why does it matter? You know, if it closes over it, what what difference does it make? You know, uh, you know. Well, back then it was just intuition and feel, but now it's just because of the quants. You know, just because of all the automated trading systems, you know. A lot of people trade off the closing price. Yeah. Uh, most people trade off the closing price you know, and trade off their mark here. And if it just, you know, if it just hangs at a level and just really can't close above it, it won't tip their systems. But you start to get, you know, I mean, different systems for different time frames have uh, different parameters. But if you get the close, I mean, it's sustaining it. It's holding it. It says, okay, I had this breakdown. Now I've taken back half of it. I want more. You know, I want more, and uh, that's why I like to use uh, the closing basis there. Moving away from the Amazon blimp, moving I, away I, from the stock not to be mentioned. I want. What, where, yeah, yeah. Where I, do you want to go? I, I want to go with, with Kate Spade because uh, this okay. is something that we were watching yesterday. Uh, I I did I did see it on CNBC at like 5:45, but we were watching this as it was happening on on Benzinga Pro. Uh, at around 12, I think it was 12.22 yesterday, we we saw and we posted uh, in pro some notable call buying in Kate Spade. Uh, not a ton of uh, movement on the stock and not a ton of action uh, and, mo and money in, in Kate Spade yesterday, uh, really until, until this trade. Uh, and around 10 minutes later, uh, the stock was halted. Dow Jones did uh, break a story that they were exploring uh, a, a potential sale. Uh, so this this uh, coincidental trade, we'll call it, netted uh, that 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 person uh, about about four hundred grand. So wow. uh, nice trade. Yeah, look at this. Uh, Twelve twenty-two. Okay, you're pulling it up here. In the seventeen calls, there was a sweep, and uh, someone mentioned it was a nickel above the uh, above the offer. Someone came about two thousand at uh, maybe it was fifteen offer. The open interest was only 2500 and we put a note in there that earnings will not until March 1st and that you know and that was when the stock was trading at 1450 uh, boom you could see it right here it happened right and this is like 1222 right here man the the clerk in the in the uh, Kate Spade uh, mail room is rich today or wherever whoever Wall Street Journal is they bought those calls there and the thing just took off uh, nothing yet out this morning any follow through here but boy oh boy here's one where watching the options activity could have paid some good dividends you know what I'm gonna say if that really was an insider trade they don't really know what they're doing because why would you go out all the way to 17 bucks <laughs> why would you go all the way out you know, why would you not just, you know, buy the 15s? 
you know, pay a little bit sure. more because at 17, 1720 stocks at 1750, 1780, they didn't even do that great. I would, if you had inside information, why not buy a little bit closer? Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's the only liquidity they can get there, but wow. Yeah. So that insider, if they if they were an insider, um, didn't really do a great job of insider trading. I'll uh, say. You know, maybe they only had four grand in their account or something. You know, to to be able to lift that. But uh, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> eighteen fifty one's where it traded up to after hours. It back off a buck. So if you're holding 40, this, forty grand. Yeah. Yeah. Forty. Excuse me. Forty grand. Uh, so if you're waiting, you know, you need to follow through a lot of times. The initial pop, and we've talked about this before. And actually, I was talking uh, with my brother-in-law who owned uh, Stillwater Mining. And it got a buyout offer at 18 bucks, And the first day, boom, it pops up to 1750 And he did sell part of, you know, he's like, well, hey, this is going to 18 In retrospect here, there's still a premium on it, but... This has really seemed to be the trend a lot of time when these rumors or something comes out. We saw that with uh, with uh, Aetna and Humana and these kind of trades. Uh, you know, a lot of times when it comes out is really an t- opportunity for you. Google. Valentina wants to know what we think about Google. Long term, this is still one of the biggest investments in my own investment portfolio. I still like Google long term. But let's talk short term here because that's what we're really interested in is if Google is looking better. Obviously got hit a little bit yesterday with the overall market. I don't know. There's a lot of overhead supply here. You know, you look from the last week and a half, this thing's 820, 815, and we're looking at the Google L, you know, 8, 812, okay. 8, you know, so much overhead supply, 6 to 7 points higher. Hard to really get, you know, all excited about Google L. Until it starts getting over 820, I'll even say get the close over 820, Joel. Yeah, exact double top there. And 800 looks like a level to me on the downside. You've traded between 800 and 820 pretty much for the majority of the month. A bunch of lows, bunch of – we're at here. I, Google, I, I still like to lurk it, like it goo. Okay, bring up the goo. No, I'll do Google because that's the one you're looking Goog at. Goog 800, the n- number for G-O-O-G, the equivalent number, I'll say is 800 bucks. Big psychological level, too, when you talk 800. Needs to get a close over 800 before everybody starts saying and the portfolio manager starts chasing it. Yeah. That's really what you want. You want it to get going high, you get the clothes over, and you get a couple of analyst upgrades, and then you get people chasing price. And that's what really drives it as those portfolio managers come in scrambling to buy the stock. Yeah, and the consolidation, you know, whether it's 780 to 800 or 800 to 820, definitely consolidation period in Google. All right, we have one minute before Phil Davis comes on here. So where are we going? We I've got. Se- where, where do you want to go? Imbalances. Uh, balances. I was going to go to Sears Holdings, but okay, let's go check out the imbalances. I haven't even looked at them today. Uh, they're all pretty small. We might want to go to Sears Holdings. Uh, GE, 84000 to buy. Alibaba, 23000 to sell. Baba's actually trading higher in the pre-market, so imbalance going the opposite direction, but they're so small. All of them are so small that it's very difficult to come in here and say any of these are going to be influential. They're all real small. So let's go to Sears Holdings. Spencer, quickly, in 30 seconds, give us the news on SHLD. They're not going and, bankrupt. And I'm on mute, which is why. No, they uh, were tra- are trading down. They announced a $200 million line of credit. That was this morning at around 6. So we have popped, and we are now trading up 11% because we've got money. Party time. Sears isn't going, you know, it's not going insolvent here for the next little while because they another $200 million bucks. So, anyways, this stock, this story is over. We know it's, you know, I don't know what the value really is in it here. The business itself is broken, broken, broken. But, oh. anyways, getting a little pop here this morning up to 910. I'm a fader of all Sears pops. <laughs> Overhead supply. That's the only thing. Oh, uh, yeah. oh. 10 I'll bucks. Say- yeah. Wouldn't you love to get to 10 and you can short the hell out of it? Yeah. I ain't going to get that high, though. I don't think getting a shot. I think 11% pop. I think you got portfolio managers saying, thank you, bang, 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 bang. So I think, you know, this stock is not up 11% by the end of the day. My Uh, own opinion. Phil Davis, founder of Phil's Stock World, will be joining us after the break. Phil's World. Whether you're a short-term swing trader or a long-term investor, you need to check out Thinkorswim, brought to you by TD Ameritrade. There's a reason why Thinkorswim has been named the number one trading platform, because it has it all. With Thinkorswim, you can trade stocks, options, futures, forex, and virtually every other type of order. Get notifications on mobile devices and interact with other traders in chat rooms. You can also use technical indicators and see the latest investing and trading education in Think Money magazine. If you want to keep up with the markets, you 
need Thinkorswim. To experience everything Thinkorswim has to offer, open a TD Ameritrade account today. Thinkorswim, the online trading platform for traders and investors. TD Ameritrade, member SIPC. All investing involves risks. Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Benzinga Pro. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconnan, along with Dennis Dick and Spencer Israel. And we have Phil Davis on the line, founder of Phil's Stock World. Phil, how you doing uh, on the second to last trading day of 2016? All right, great. Happy, happy almost New Year. Yeah, almost New Year. So, if you could have one word to describe uh, 2016 uh, and the markets, uh, what would that one word be? <laughs> Trumped. <laughs> right. That's a good one. That's a good one. We'll give him that. <laughs> I'll say the same thing, Trump. Yep, so that Not was... Trump, Trumped. Trumped. Trumped, okay. And that Trump uh, trumps... Uh, Trump Brexit here, so a lot of expectations about what he's going to do. A lot of rallies and uh, uh, the steals, some of the industrials here. Uh, looking into your crystal ball for 2017, I mean, are these investors going to be rewarded uh, with uh, a change in policy? Uh, I well, okay, let's define rewarded. So all all the policy is going to do, even if he gets his trillion dollar you know, proposed uh, stimulus in um, the infrastructure plan. In. That's only two, that's only um, over ten years. So it's a hundred billion dollars a year. It's nothing in the, you know, the government spends three hundred billion dollars, three trillion dollars a year. So a hundred billion dollars is three percent of the government spending. That's not going to do anything to move the needle in this country. We need much more structural reform than that. And the market is pricing in um, perfection. The, the market's pricing in. Uh, economic expansion is going to come from tax incentives, deregulation, Keynesian government kind of spending. Um, they're expecting increasing output. They're expecting better demand for assets. They're expecting better tax structures. They're expecting um, uh, a, sh a shift towards um, a, a more economic authority, less regulation. You know, I mean, all these expectations are already baked in. What on earth is the guy going to actually do to meet the expectations that are currently in the marketplace? So I think it's going to be, I think, yes, there'll be changes towards all these things that they're talking about, but I think realistically, the market's way ahead of itself already. So looking into 2017, we've seen the financials take off to the tune of almost 30% some of these banks since Trump has got in. Do you feel like the financials is the same story? They're way ahead of themselves and there's not going to be way, as much upside or is that a different story? No, I think that I think you start you start trying to deregulate the banks and let them run wild again. I think you'll have the Democrats doing more sit-ins on the floor of the House. Um, I don't think it's going to be that easy to pay, to pass to to let the banks run wild the way they did back in 2008. And um, they they're never going to get back to those kind of revenues right now. Right now, they're being priced out as if they're going to get back to the to revenues that they had when they used to lie and cheat and steal. And, and, and now you know. I, you know, and, that, and, and don't forget how they pop like paper tigers. I mean, when the, when, when the economy went bad, those banks lost multi-billions of dollars instantly. They wrote off all those gains they, they made were fake. That's what everybody forgets about what happened in 2008 and 2009. It wasn't, the reason the banks went down so quickly is because the profits they booked were bullshit. And once it, once it hit the fan and they had to show real money, it wasn't there. They never actually earned the kind of money they claim they earned. They were wiped out by the losses when they wrote them down after the fact. People just don't understand how accounting works. So what's your story then for the banks? Is this now overdone here? Would you be looking at shorting some of these banks on you know, these huge it's, pops that they've had? Or? Too scary to short them because you have to understand a bank can say they earn whatever they want to say because they can fiddle around with their reserve ratios and they can change the parameters on the spreadsheet and they can do it until there's a reckoning. 
And what you had in 2008 was a reckoning when the banks finally had to true up their balance sheets. But the earnings before that were fake. This is what people don't understand. What they do is they look back at 2008 and say, oh, the banks took some losses. But the banks took losses because the profits before that were fake. So I'm not saying the banks can't fake their profits again, especially if they get deregulated. But yeah, I will say they're fake, and that to me doesn't make them investable, but it does make them a bit scary to short. Um, so, you could do something fun, though, like the ultra, um, what's that old, is it XKF, the ultra short on the um, banks? I just prefer to just like, like sell, sell short the XLF, but yeah, they were, there's, there's a lot of different ETFs that play them to the no, downside as more, well. I think it's more fun, SKF, right. So yeah. SKF is at 30, and it's more fun to go long a triple, a triple short on the banks you know, as a speculative play, than short the, you know, the annoyance of shorting. Or there's um, FAZ, F-A-Z, is another one. What's FAZ at? FAZ is at... Um, Probably yeah, at Lowe's. 21. So either FAZ or SKF are two ways to short the banks uh, using an ultra. And you can do a spread on those and uh, just, you know, speculating that they'll come back down. What about these runs that we've had not only in the banks, but we've had, you know, we call it the Trump rally. We've had in a lot of different stocks, like, you know, the steel sector has been incredible. You watched a stock like U.S. Steel go from $16 to 38 bucks, and it's sitting up here around 35 here right now. Is this overdone as well? Because, you know, here's, you know, something, you know, U.S. Steel, U.S. company, go rah, rah, Trump. Is this overdone just because he's not going to be able to do as much as we think he might be able to do? Well, now you see, that's interesting because U.S. Steel, and I'm not saying U.S. Steel is not a little bit overdone right now, but U.S. Steel benefits because if he cracks down on the Chinese imports, yes. that's where you know, U.S. Steel gets killed by the cheap price Chinese imports coming in. If he stops that, because the Chinese, see, the Chinese, <clears throat> I was just writing about this uh, today, the Chinese, um, they, run, they, run, they run their economy. The state owns the banks. And they own the companies that lend the banks money. So when they, you know, they have all these zombie companies that make money, and that includes steel mills, the state doesn't want to lay off thousands or millions of people. So they keep these companies running whether they're making money or not. The banks keep lending them money whether they're making money or not. So you know, it's, just, it's a system that just keeps perpetuating itself. So what do they do? That means they have steel mills that are making steel even when there's no actual demand for the steel. They ship it all over the world at ridiculously low prices that nobody could possibly afford. The Chinese companies can't afford to do it. They're losing billions of dollars, but it gets buried in the state budgets. Um, so it, it is anti-competitive, and Trump is right to that extent that, that there should be tariffs and to rein it in, but you have to be really careful about sparking a trade war that, that damages everybody. But, so, but to that extent, that's good for U.S. Steel. It's good for Cleveland Cliffs, was one of our favorite plays last year. It also took off like a rocket. Um, that's CLF on the boards. Okay. That's so some of, the, some of those plays are good. Let's move into your pick for 2017. SLW, tell us uh, the fundamentals, what you're looking at, how you're playing it, and the catalyst. Uh, okay, the fundamentals. Silver Wheaton is a streaming company, which means that they have contracts with silver mines to uh, purchase large amounts of silver over periods of time, generally four-year contracts, three, four, five-year contracts. So figure it averages four years. They're just working off the last expensive year for silver when it was over $30 was 2013. So they're just cycling out of 2013, and now all of their contracts are essentially under $20 for silver. And not only that, though, but they don't pay spot for silver. They pay below spot for silver because they're guaranteeing. So they're sort of like buying uh, futures contracts, but they're buying actual contracts to guarantee they'll purchase production. So essentially the silver, the silver miners are using them as sort of a put contract to guarantee they'll get at least as much for some percentage of their production. Um, so they stream it like that. Now, on the other hand, they'll sell it pretty much at spot. So their margins are basically spot plus, you know, they, their margins are basically whatever they buy it for and then the spot price. So when silver is flat, when silver is flattened out over the last three years at around where it is now, which is what, um, what is it, 16 bucks, right? So it's $16. And you've got to figure the average cost of silver wheat is something like fifteen, fourteen, fifty, something like that. So they're making pretty good money. They're going to sell uh, six hundred million something ounces. They also, oh, it's gold too. It's not just silver. It's silver and gold, um, but much more silver than gold. <clears throat> so um, 
Although, although numbers-wise, actually, if you think about it, I think probably with the gold, since it's so much more per ounce, it may not be that different on revenues. Um, anyhow, so that's, that's the gist of the company. Now, fundamentally, so the point being that silver is finally is flatlined. Now, if it starts going up in any meaningful way, the leverage they have is tremendous because they make all their money as a spread on the silver from what they, from the, what they promised to buy it for. So how are you playing it? Are you playing it with the stock? Are you selling some puts? Are you buying some calls? Uh, how are you putting your, uh, your theory into action? Well, officially on Silver Wheaton, um, our trade of the year, hang on, let me just get the exact numbers because I'm going to mess it up for you guys. Um, we have two trades. I'll tell you which one of them. All right. <clears throat> so for Silver Wheaton, the way we're playing it, the very simple long-term spread is um, what we're doing is selling the 2019 $15 put. So we're promising to buy the stock for $15 in 2019, for, for, um, and we're going to get paid $2.80. So our net entry would be uh, $12.20. Okay, so that's step number one. What kind of liquidity $12. is when you go that far out? What kind of liquidity is there? It's actually not bad. It's not, it's not that hard to sell puts, frankly. And it depends on the, it depends on the stock. Well, it's probably about five hundred to sell outstanding contracts. Maybe um, yeah, about five six hundred outstanding contracts when you go out that far. There's probably a thousand on the long side. Okay. So you know, if you want to do ten, it's not a big deal at all. You can only you can sell them or buy them almost any time you want to. Um, then there's um, then on the on the plus side, on the other side, on the calls, we're going to buy fifteen. So we so we collected twenty eight hundred dollars basically. Uh, selling the puts. And all we're doing is promising to buy a stock that's currently at $18.50. We're promising to buy it for $15, which is more than a 20% discount from where it is. Um, on the plus side, we are going to buy 15, not 10, but we're going to buy, so we sold 10 puts. We're going to buy 15 calls of the $15 calls. Those are $4.75. And we're going to sell 15 of the $20 calls for $2.65. So that's going to net us into the entire trade. When you do the math, it's three hundred and fifty dollars for the entire trade of net outlay. Don't forget though, you're promising to buy fifteen thousand dollars worth of silver wheaton if it's below fifteen dollars. So that's your hanging obligation. So you promised to buy fifteen thousand dollars worth of silver wheaton. Now, if however though the stock doesn't is not below fifteen, those will expire worthless, and anything above fifteen is profit for you. And you can make up to seven thousand five hundred dollars back if, if Silver Wheaton is just at twenty in um, January two thousand eighteen. So that would be where you're looking for is looking at SLW maybe at the end of twenty seventeen or you know early twenty eighteen to maybe go up to twenty dollars from here. Yeah, that's all we're looking for. In a perfect we're scenario. Looking. Yeah, I mean it's a five. A five stay above six. fifteen, and the whole main point is stay above fifteen, and then you're probably gonna. So you're you're making money if the stock stays above fifteen, really. Yeah, and 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 uh, and there we are, kind of betting on Trump doing something because, uh, you know, that look, the Fed has flooded the supply of money, of in the in the United States, the supply of dollars, is up a hundred percent since the financial crisis. The thing is, the velocity of that money, okay, has gone to is very low. So money doesn't move much because the economy is actually very slow. But there's tons of money out there. And right now it's sort of sloshing around and it's moving out of bonds, it's moving into the asset markets and so on and so forth. Eventually it's going to start causing inflation, especially if the economy does pick up and starts to move. Inflation can rise very, very rapidly. That is fantastic for gold, fantastic for silver. So, so Phil, kind of if you, really like. what about gold, the miners themselves? So SLW is more of a silver play. What about like, you know, a Barrick or a Newmont? What are you looking at from the yeah, gold well, we had an, Yeah, we had an article on the weekend called Secret Santa's Inflation Hedges for 2017. And uh, Barrick was actually also one of the ones we featured. And uh, Barrick Gold um, is ABX. And uh, we like them too. Now, they're, you know, I think they're a fantastic buy. Barrick Gold has 100 million ounces of proven gold. So at um, what are we at now? Eleven fifty an ounce or something? So um, eleven fifty an ounce times a hundred million is one hundred and fifteen billion dollars worth of gold that they have proven in the ground. The you can buy the entire company for seventeen billion eighteen for eighteen billion dollars right now at fifteen twenty eight. 
and they've got they've got a hundred plus billion dollars worth of gold in the ground. Now the problem is they don't make a hundred billion dollars because they have to pull the gold out of the ground. Right. And the so the difference is the extraction cost is their net cost of gold, which is roughly about nine fifty. They they are very good, very efficient producer. So it costs them about nine fifty to pull gold out of the ground. If they sell it for eleven fifty, they're making two hundred dollar profit. All right, but even two hundred dollars profit on a hundred million ounces of, of gold is twenty billion dollars. So in the very least, at today's prices, they are underpriced by a good 10, 15, ten to twenty percent. If gold goes up, though, you know, in other words, if gold goes up just a little bit. If gold goes up from eleven hundred to thirteen hundred, their profits double. So on a twenty percent move up in gold, their profits double. We so, been... so they're already heavily leveraged to gold. All right. We've been on the line with Phil Davis. He's the founder of Phil's Stock World. You can follow him on Twitter at Phil's Stock World. Uh, very bullish on the precious metals, or at least looking for them not to go down any further. Phil, thanks a lot for coming on, and we'll get you on early in 2017. All right. Thanks, guys. Great talking to you. Have a good new year. Hey, thanks, Phil. I mean, it, you know, talking strategy here and kind of, you know, along the lines, you know, with Nick Shaheen, you know, maybe not exactly trying to figure out where something's going to go, but being comfortable where it's not going to go, Dennis. And yeah. I think that's... yeah, there's a strategy there for sure. And I like the way he was analyzing Barrick Gold, you know, saying how much gold they have in the ground here, you know, analyzing it from the company. Because a lot of people look, you know, at these miners and they look at value. And they look at, well, they made, you know, a dollar last year. They're trading at a multiple P, multiple. But he's looking at how much gold do these guys have? And, you know, okay, well, if they can pull it out of the ground at 950 and sell it at 1150, they're making $200 an ounce. They have so many ounces of gold. It's what the company's got in, you know, gold. You know, that's what it's worth. And that's an interesting way to value Barrick Gold. And, you know, I never really look at it that way either. Barrick is one that I do not have. I don't have very much gold or silver in my investment portfolio. But maybe I'm going to look to add a little bit this year. I know, you know, if you're looking back in the summer, those stocks were really lofty. Obviously, if you were talking about what were going to be the stocks of 2016, if you were looking back in May, June, and July, you were going to say it was going to be the gold miners. But they've given back half of their gains. And if you always talk about 50% retracement, Joel, you look at a stock like Barrick gold started the year down around seven bucks went up to 23 now it's around 15 well that's you know so 7 23 carry the two what is that air mass six eight 15 bucks is right around the 50 percent retracement right yeah and it's kind of it's holding here and this is a weekly chart going a little farther up uh you also talk about you know i'm going to mention gilmar alice again here you know where you have boy someone wants only sing at 14 bucks right I mean, one, two, yeah. three, and Barrick yeah. does that. Remember that, Dennis? I don't know when we were doing the show a couple years ago. I think it was on the way down. Did it, it like make like thirty lows in a row? It uh, 30, gives you a lot of chances. Was it thirteen? Where was this level? This is uh, a weekly, but uh, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, here's three weeks or something like that, where you know, thirteen bucks, thirteen bucks, thirteen bucks, and then you know took it out and then comes back up comes back up to that level so you know uh, uh, a very very liquid stock that uh, maybe giving you a good technical setup yeah i mean there's some value here you know now like i was looking you know in the summer and i was like wow that's when i sold some of my gold stocks and i was a little bit early i had my barrett gold and i think i sold it at 19 i sold some more 20 and it went to 23 so you know obviously you know i got out a little bit early but you know, I still, you know, participate in the bulk of the move here. Now it's back down here at $15. I think, well, maybe I should be rebuying the stock that I sold at 19 or 20 you know, and put Barrick back in my portfolio just from a diversification approach because, you know, I'm one that, you know, in my you know, portfolio, you know, I don't always, you know, stay fully diversified with gold and silver. I own almost zero gold and silver here now. So probably not a bad idea to maybe add a little bit here as, you know, we've pulled back significantly from where we were in the summer and everybody's forgotten about it. And all it takes is a little bit of fear in the market. It. All it takes is, hey, maybe, you know, Trump isn't going to be able to do the things that, you know, maybe we think he can do. And, you know, you could see the precious metals catch up early. So, you know, it's not a bad idea, and I don't mind Phil's thoughts on that. All right. Um, any changes uh, in imbalances here? Probably not. I've seen the video. small. Bear Gold, we're just talking about one that jumps out. 133000 to buy. I guess everybody was listening to uh, – to Phil's thoughts here, because their bear goals trade up one percent in the free market, but no, actually, you know, the balances are really small. But that's typical for a day like you know your holiday trade. There isn't a 
lot of institutions coming in here and you know moving their positions around. At least not until probably tomorrow. Tomorrow you're probably going to see some action as there's some real jockeying there for the end of the year. Again, if I'm approaching today, I'm looking for my two day rule. I already thought that Nvidia would have a week open. It's fallen another dollar since we started talking about it here. I do think Nvidia is probably going to test the pre market low. What's the pre market low, Joel? Ah, uh, let's go to Nvidia. We said we want to talk about Nvidia again, but we are. <laughs> What's the pre market low? Uh, it's our leader for today, though. Uh, our pre market low in Nvidia is right in that area that I mentioned, uh, 104.51. I had mentioned a double bottom there, right in that area, 103.71 to 104.12. So, you know, same scenario as yesterday where it couldn't, but on the opposite end of the market. 120.36 was the pre-market high. You got the pop. You came up just short of that level, and then you tanked. So here on the downside, see what happens. See if they can get that to the pre-market low because you also have to think about it. A lot of people, I mean, you know, they were fortunate to short it, you know, between 107 and 120, you know, are sitting on some profits. They could, you know, care less about you know, the longer term direction of the area. I kind of like. I think there's some underneath supply or underneath demand here, though. When yep. you're talking close to 100 bucks, I think there's underneath demand. And I'd love to see a flush to 100. Ace would say maybe it could test 100 today. I don't know if it's got the gas to get way down to there. I think it could definitely test that 104.50. I'm going to look to buy this pullback here just for a day trade. If it gets down to 100, I'm probably going to try to pull the trigger. I don't think it's going to get that low, though. I think yeah, you're probably yeah. going to have to be earlier than that. But I do think it could close a lot higher than it, you know, than that 104.50. I think it could close above 107, 108. So if you want to make a wager here, Joel, I'm going to say Nvidia flushes, but I think it still closes above where it's trading right now at 106.20. And I'll throw that out there for a lunch. I think it closes above 106.20. Uh, it's down three bucks on the day. I'm not, <laughs> you don't I'm want to short no, the No, 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 no. I said 110. Uh, Valentina wants to know if we have broke up with Twitter. And uh, We haven't talked about it? <laughs> we haven't talked about Twitter? I broke up a long time ago with Twitter. I was never really in I was in a, a short-term relationship. I'll call it, I was dating Twitter for a little bit when I had it from the 14 up to the, like the $17 area, but that was it. And I haven't had Twitter in my portfolio for a while, and I still don't like it because I think its valuation is too much of an issue, and I think competition is too much, and I think a lot of people don't get it. So I am not a fan of Twitter here. I do think we're eventually going back to test the 14, although... Short term, you know, you can always get involved with Twitter again for a day trade because Twitter fits the bill of a stock that's going to be hit with tax loss selling in the next day or two. It also fits the bill for a stock of the January effect. And the January effect is the stocks are really beat up and sold hard in December, the late December to lock in those losses will be rebought come January or other people will come back in and start maybe nibbling at the stocks, you know, looking to buy the dip in January. So I think Twitter could see a little pop early January. Long term here, I don't see a buyout for Twitter. Long term, no I still people think people don't get in. Long term, I think Twitter could eventually test the fourteen dollar area here. Okay, so will you go um, fourteen fifty versus eighteen fifty for one of those steak dinners? Yes, the January like? effect. No, you have the no, January man. effect. Oh, the comment. All right. This is the time to pop. I'm going to be a seller of the pop. Gets back to eighteen, I'm selling it. That's what I'm doing. Uh, I was married to Twitter sure. earlier in the year, and I dumped it. But uh, I'm gonna have to not engaged anymore. I'm I gonna, thought you were engaged through options. I'm gonna no no no. I mean, I still have some uh, some Januarys, but I'm gonna have to. So you are plug. still engaged. Yeah, I still engaged. You got the options. You're engaged with the I'll, stock. I'm gonna have, <laughs> I'm gonna have to look and see what my overall P and L because I got very lucky um, buying some puts up here. I had no idea it was going back to 16. I like the technical formation here institutions accumulating it here at the $16 level. I think maybe I'll figure out when their earnings are, get a little closer to that. I think they picked up some good traffic um, over the election. MAUs will increase. But if you want some insight on Twitter, and our last guest of the year tomorrow, do we confirm Sean's going to come on and be our second guest? Yeah, Sean, Sean Udall is coming on tomorrow. He's going to bring us from the end of the show tomorrow straight to the beginning of the show uh, on, on Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> he'll, 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 he'll be with us <laughs> all weekend. He'll be talking here about Twitter and Twi Apple and Facebook and everything. 
No, uh, Sean's been good, though, man. I, I mean, when the market was getting pounded at Brexit, he was bullish. When it got pounded after the election, he's bullish. He has a target on the S&P still up in the 2400. So, man, he, he's made some great calls. So I'm looking forward to uh, to the interview with Sean tomorrow, 9 o'clock. Let's wrap things up, Spencer. Yep. So on top of Sean tomorrow, we also have a new guest, Curtis Monopoly. He's the head trader at a site called CompoundTrading.com. If you missed any part of our show today, you want to catch it again, find it on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or YouTube. You can find it by going to any of Benzinga's channels on those various platforms. Also, don't forget, you can get a free two-week trial of Benzinga Pro by going to pro.benzinga.com or calling us up at 313-723-2000. There was a discount involved, as you say, that you listen to the show. There are also, I'm sure, some end-of-the-year discounts on top of that. Okay, that's it for us today. We're going to let everyone go now. Hope you have a good rest of your day, and we'll be back with you folks for uh, tomorrow and our final show of 2016. Whether you're a short-term swing trader or a long-term investor, you need to check out Thinkorswim, brought to you by TD Ameritrade. There's a reason why Thinkorswim has been named the number one trading platform, because it has it all. With Thinkorswim, you can trade stocks, options, futures, forex, and virtually every other type of order. Get notifications on mobile devices and interact with other traders in chat rooms. You can also use technical indicators and see the latest investing and trading education in Think Money magazine. If you want to keep up with the markets, you need Thinkorswim. To experience everything Thinkorswim has to offer, open a TD Ameritrade account today. Thinkorswim, the online trading platform for traders and investors. TD Ameritrade, member SIPC. All investing involves risks.